Uh, Minister Dix, you often mention your um, single site policy at long-term care homes, uh, but those workers are allowed to have other jobs and some have taken jobs in fast food restaurants and to home care workers. Um, and given the you know almost daily outbreaks at long-term care homes, are you considering eliminating you know those exceptions that are made to allow for second jobs? Well, I, I'll, I'll start, <laughs> and then because uh, it is actually my my order. Um, but uh, it, you know, we we have to recognize that um, people's circumstances are challenging, and uh, we made some changes to make it easier for people to have a full time job as a care aide in a care home. But there are people who have needs that aren't met by that, and yes, we we can't. Um, prevent people from having um, the means to to live and the needs that they have in their family. But we do may pay a lot of attention to all of us in health care, making sure we're monitoring our, our health every day before we go into work, making sure that we are not going and participating in risky activities. And these are the things that we need to pay attention to more than ever right now. So yes, we can sometimes have other jobs that are necessary for, for us, but that means we have to make sure that we're adhering to our safety protocols in every aspect of our life. Just say, I think what made the single site order unique in British Columbia was the decision that we made to, uh, to provide uh, real support to really implement the order. And that meant raising up the salary levels of people who were paid below HEABC levels. And that was the annualized cost of that is $165.4 million. And that tells you a little bit about how much less than the uh, negotiated level that many uh, people in long-term care were being paid uh, prior to the pandemic. That had improved in the previous years. Was, was The gap was still very high. So um, the seriousness with which we, we take the order that was put in place uh, for long-term care, the single site for long-term care, the seriousness of that order is reflected in in the, the very significant investment and the sheer number of people, I think it was 8,800, who directly moved, including all the other people who benefited um, from the, uh, the salary decision around the order. So we take the single site order uh, very seriously in long-term care. But uh, what it reminds us of is that all of these measures are necessary. And uh, what are all the measures? Well, they're all of the infection prevention measures that Dr. Henry just referred to and that are there. The need for significant staffing and improved st and new staffing in long-term care. And we've seen, I, th I believe, uh, in the last couple of months, more than 1,000 people hired in long-term care. The single site order is critically important as well. The incorporation of long-term care into, uh, into our uh, PPE supply chain is very important. The final component of it is we all have to uh, understand, I think, there are 50 to 60,000 people who work in long-term care, more than 100,000 people who work in health care. And when COVID-19 is as present in the community as it is now, it's going to touch people who uh, work in health care. And that reminds us of the critical link between all of our behavior, that we're all in this, that we're all part of the effort to, uh, to um, protect long-term care, every single person in BC, and that a critical part of it, in addition to all the actions we're taking, is uh, for us to reduce transmission. But, uh, um, you know, BC's record on this has been good compared to other jurisdictions, but the losses have been, uh, to my way of thinking, enormous. I feel them today and we feel them every day. I know every uh, care aide and nurse and doctor and support worker who works in long-term care feels them and uh, that's why the single site order is so important. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, given the fact though that many home care workers visit private residences every day and some then go on to work at long-term care homes, Will you reconsider the call that you know many have made that masks be required by clients and families and visitors in um, private residences where home care workers attend because they feel their bubble is just very large because of that? 
Yeah, so there are processes in place uh, for making sure that visits in home care can happen safely. So there, there are long-standing infection control processes, things like minimizing the number of people that are in the room and only those necessary when you go in to see the client, um, making sure that you're using appropriate PPE, that if somebody is in the room, they maintain their safe distance, um, you, wearing a non-medical mask if they need to. But they should not be in a room full of people when they're going to provide um, home care and there's ways that you can minimize it and I think there are good protocols in place to support people in home care. Uh, thank you Dr. Henry for taking my question here. Uh, senior advocate uh, is Bell McKenzie and the Care Providers Association have both said that no, there's no known cases of COVID going into long-term care homes through visitors and I'm wondering if that's still true and they're also concerned that uh, there's not real clear guidelines requiring these care homes to open up the visiting of the one designated person so they can get uh, more time and help out more feeding their loved ones um, and not leaving them alone to die. So I wonder if you can respond to that. Yeah, so this is a, a challenging question because which came first? We've restricted visitors in long-term care, as you know, because of the devastation, and we only have to look at this weekend to know that what happens when the virus gets in. And yes, um, we have not had introductions that we're aware of. Sometimes it's hard to tell whether it's from a resident or whether it's a staff person. but. Um, you know, with the visitations that we've had, we've done under specific protocols to prevent that. So we are not going back to the type of visitation that we had when we know that there was an increased risk when you had people who were coming in and out of the, the care home on a routine basis. So the fact that we have restricted visitation means that that makes it a much less likely way the virus can be introduced into a care home. And we have to recognize that the people who work in care homes are there for every, uh, the, every resident in that home and are providing care every day to residents residents in that home and we can't um, we we know that when we have transmission in the community the probability that somebody at one point may inadvertently bring it into a care home goes up and that is why we have all of those measures in place to try and um, detect that early to make sure that people aren't coming in ill to make sure that we're not transmitting it between healthcare workers inadvertently as well. So it is a, an incredibly challenging time and we're not alone in that. We're seeing this across the country, we're seeing this across the world, that communal settings like this where we need workers to care for people are risky settings right now. And so we have to continue to do our best to keep those as safe as possible. And yes, there is an ongoing effort to try and systematize the essential workers and make sure our essential visits and make sure that family are able to safely be with their loved one. But it is very challenging right now with the amount of COVID that we're seeing circulating in our community. And we only have to look at what's happening in care homes, not just in the, the lower mainland, but here on the island and in the interior in the north as well. So uh, it's it's a very challenging time and people are doing their best. Do you have a follow-up, Rob? Well, just on that, because their concern is the visitors that are going in, whether they're essential or designated, are not spreading the disease. And all they want is some direction to the homes to allow them to spend more time than half an hour every week or two. And um, just the same people going in and preferably in their rooms where they're not um, causing so much work for the, um, the staff. But they need more clear direction to the operators to be consistent because about 20% of people are happy with the visits they're getting. It's the other 80% that don't seem to be opening up. Like, We've provided clear direction and I know all of the care homes and the care providers are working to make sure they are following those directions. 